Hello everyone. Welcome to A Good Night for a Murder, a Victorian true crime podcast. My name is Kim and I think one of my favorite things about the Victorian era is that you could just up and decide to change your name, make up a new story for yourself, and you could be whoever you wanted. Because who would know? Who would ask? There was no computers, no databases to be flagged in. People couldn't just look you up. If you left an employer who would give you a bad reference, change your name. If you owed someone money, you didn't want to pay it back, change your name. Maybe move cities. If you wanted to say you were an heiress to some secret fortune, go ahead and say it. Want to con multiple American banks out of millions? Just make something up. Because that is exactly what a poor farm girl from Ontario, Canada did in the late 19th century. This is the story of Cassie Chadwick. But first, a Victorian society tip. In 1880, the girl's own paper published an article titled Earning One's Living, Fruitful Fields for Honest Labor, where the author endeavored to provide a, quote, rapid survey of some of the various occupations by which you could earn a livelihood. Let's hear her advice. Sculpture in wood. You may get work in the trade from upholsters or private orders to sculpture panels, brackets, backs of pianos, backs of books, and portfolios, cabinets, and picture frames. Engraving on wood. Title pages, headings for new chapters, decorative tailpieces, armorial bearings, mottos, and names for pasting inside the covers of books, portraits from photographs, facsimiles of sketches and copies of paintings. All of these subjects provide work of a lucrative character for those who have learned this beautiful art. Designing patterns. For papers, for molding in wood or plaster, for carpets, for calico prints, for the Indian or African export trade, or for home use, as well as for china printing, designers for muslin and Swiss lace curtains can get a good employment. China painting. As an example of what may be gained at this work, I may observe that for a well-painted plate, you may earn from 20 to 50 shillings and possibly more. Reporting and shorthand writing. The government pays a guinea a day for the taking of notes and a shilling of folio is paid by law and parliamentary committee. Other career choices mentioned in the article include frame making and gilding, mosaic work, painting on panels, millinery or hat making, law copying, nursing, painting in watercolors, oil painting, horticultural, or agriculture. Cassie Chadwick did not begin to go by the name Cassie Chadwick until nearly 30 years into her career as a con woman. We need to start back in 1857 when she was born in Appen, Ontario, Canada, as Elizabeth Bigley. Her parents were Daniel and Marian Bigley, and she was the fifth child born in a family of six girls and two boys. She was a quiet child, having lost her hearing in one ear and developing a speech impediment as a result. She spoke very little, choosing her words with care. Her classmates described her as peculiar and a daydreamer that would often tell fibs. Now, we don't know what young Elizabeth's endgame was, but at the age of 13, she decides she needs some money. Now, the year is 1870, and women won't have the right to take out loans or even open a bank account for nearly another 100 years. That's right, friends, sorry to blindside you with that one, but did you know that women in the U.S. and Canada couldn't even open a bank account without a male cosigner until the 1960s? So anyway, young Elizabeth, or Betsy, as she was called, forges a letter notifying herself that an uncle in London, England, has died and left her a small inheritance. I'm not even sure where she learned what such a letter would look like, but it looked authentic enough to fool a local bank, and they issued checks for her, allowing her to spend the inheritance money in advance. For a few months, she carries on writing bad checks to local businesses, but she's eventually found out, and because she's so young, they tell her, don't do it again, and release it to her parents. Three years later, when she's 16, she runs away from home and tries to convince a wealthy farmer to loan her $250. He finds her suspicious, calls the police, and she's apprehended. At the age of 21, she steals a pocket watch and tries to put it up as collateral for a loan. Again, the police are involved, and her father settles with the victim. Undeterred, the same year, Betsy tries to present herself as Elizabeth Cunard in Toronto. The Cunards were a wealthy Canadian family who owned one of the first transatlantic shipping lines. She literally had no connection to the family, but who's going to ask, right? 
She uses a forged letter of introduction and bogus check to set up accounts where she acquires $10,000 worth of goods on credit before her scheme falls apart and she flees to Toronto. So this is the documented history we have of Betsy scams over the past eight years or so of her life. But I'm sure there were more because your girl is learning. She has been taking notes and she comes up with a plan. At the age of 22, she gets some expensive letterhead printed with the name and address of a fictitious attorney in Ontario. She drafts up a little letter to herself that some wealthy philanthropist has died and left her $15,000. That's about $430,000 in today money, which is like way more pocket money than I have. But if you walked into somewhere and said, I'm an heiress to $430,000 today, nobody would really care that much. But I found some cost of living information that said a four room, 1200 square foot house in 1880 will cost like $700. So she set up to inherit enough money to buy more than 20 houses. Listen, I'm not in finance. I'm not a historian. I'm just a podcaster trying to give a little context to why people care about Betsy's $15,000. Anyway, she forges a letter saying she's expecting an inheritance of $15,000. And to back it up, she has calling cards printed that read Miss Bigley, heiress to $15,000. So if you're a fan of period dramas, you've seen how these calling cards are used. They're like personal business cards where when you go to visit someone, you give the servant your card to bring to the master or mistress of the house to announce your presence. Betsy would use them when she went shopping. She would choose an expensive item and write a check for the amount they exceeded the cost of the item, and the business would give her cash back for the difference. If anyone questioned her, she would flash in one of her calling cards and they'd apologize and send her on her way. This just strikes me as so very Victorian, like, well, if you can get it printed on a card, it must be true. And even if they didn't entirely believe it, the manners and reputations were so, so important. Better just move things along and get rid of her, lest you cause a scene. Although she wasn't actually able to keep this up for very long, she was eventually arrested, and it sounds like she was found not guilty by reason of insanity. Either their legal version of insanity was very different than ours today, or she had a very good defense attorney. After this, she makes her way to Cleveland, Ohio to live with her sister for a while. I'm not sure if she goes there of her own accord or if her family is like, Betsy, enough is enough. Please leave the country. But she winds up with her newly married sister and brother-in-law. Now, Betsy is a lot of things, but she's not a freeloader. So she comes up with a plan to support herself by starting a business of her own. She assumes a new name. Madame Lydia Devere starts saying that she's recently been widowed. She starts renting the lower floor of a house and sets up a shop as a clairvoyant. She funds this by taking out a loan using her sister and brother-in-law's furniture as collateral. Now, I don't know if she just straight up posed as her sister or if due diligence from the banks was not then what it is today, but they did find out about this and try and throw her out, but she was like, too bad, you can't, I'm already leaving. So in 1883, Betsy is about 25 years old and living as Madame Lydia Devere when she meets and marries Dr. Wallace S. Springsteen in a ceremony before the Justice of the Peace. The wedding announcement appears in the paper. She moves in with Dr. Springsteen and within a matter of days, all these various merchants and tradespeople who Betsy has apparently swindled at some point or another start turning up at the new couple's doorstep looking to be paid. Poor Dr. Springsteen, now accountable for his wife's actions, pays off her debts and divorces her. Their marriage lasted 12 days. So Betsy does not want that history following her around, so she changes her name again, this time to Madame Marie La Rosa, and travels around offering her services as a clairvoyant, living in various boarding houses, running little side scams and hustles to get by. At one point, she was in Erie, Pennsylvania and claimed to be the niece of a famous Civil War general, but said she was very sick and just trying to get back home to Cleveland. So they took up a collection to send her home, but it wasn't charity. They were expecting to be repaid by whoever was waiting to receive her in Cleveland. But when they wrote inquiring about how they were to be paid back, she just wrote back and was like, oh, she died. Sorry. And never pays anybody anything. She finds a new husband, John R. Scott, and she lives with him on his farm for four years until she gets tired of farm life and reportedly went into town and confessed to adultery, then instructed an attorney to file for divorce from Farmer John and disappears. I'm sure poor John was scandalized, but what does that matter to her? She just moves along, makes up a new name. 
I'm not quite sure where exactly she goes from there. She may have stayed in the U.S. or went back to Canada, but in 1886, she gives birth to a son that she names Emil Hoover. And I can't tell if it's because she married a man named Hoover or if she just made up the last name Hoover for herself. But either way, she has a baby, and it sounds like she sent him to be raised by her family in Canada. She has kept up the Clairvoyant Act, though, and in about 1888, she meets a client named Joseph Lamb, who is apparently very taken with her abilities. He pays her $10,000 to serve as his financial advisor, which in today money is about $312,000. So not bad, Betsy. He also is willing to do certain favors to stay in her good graces, including cashing multiple forged promissory notes for her totaling over $40,000 or $125,000 in today's money. Eventually, they're both caught and arrested, but Joseph was viewed as another victim of one of her scams, whereas Betsy was convicted in 1889 of forgery and sentenced to nine and a half years in prison in Toledo. When Joseph was asked how or why he went along with the thing she asked, he claimed he was hypnotized by her. And you may be rolling your eyes, but many people reported the same thing about interacting with Betsy. Spiritualism and the power of hypnosis were super prevalent around the turn of the 20th century, and hypnosis was actually a very acceptable, common explanation for anyone needed an excuse for, actually. Adultery, runaways, and so on. Anyway, she only serves about four years of her sentence before she is paroled. The year is now 1893, and she is living in Cleveland as Cassie Hoover, so I will refer to her from here on out as Cassie. She opens a brothel on the west side of the city, though one does not admit it's a brothel. Rather, she advertises it as a boarding house for single women. While there, she meets a wealthy widower doctor named Leroy Chadwick. Cassie sees the opportunity here and plays the part of a genteel woman who has also been widowed, just trying to get by operating a respectable establishment. And Dr. Chadwick, as gently as he can, I'm sure, reveals to her that the home actually has a very well-known reputation for being a brothel. Cassie is so shocked and overcome by this news that she faints. The good doctor revives her, and when she comes to, she frantically begs him to take her out of there immediately before anyone has a chance to think she will be involved in such nefarious activity. And Dr. Chadwick, her knight in shining armor, he falls for it. He moves her out of there, and in 1897, they are married, and he moves her into his home on Euclid Avenue, also known as Cleveland's Millionaire's Row. The wealth exhibited by the residents of Cleveland's Millionaire's Row at the time far exceeded that of Fifth Avenue in New York. All tycoons of the oil, steel, coal, railway, and automobile industries, bankers, engineers, the likes of John D. Rockefeller, U.S. Senator Marcus Hanna, John Hay. Listen, it was a bunch of really, really, really rich white men, all with very impressive mustaches. Just having a Euclid Avenue address, though, does not make you one of them, right? Elite society was difficult to infiltrate, and Cassie was viewed as an outsider who tried in vain to buy her friendships. After all, Dr. Chadwick had just turned up with her as his wife one day. No one knew her family or background, and there were whispers that he had found her in a brothel. Either way, she was there now, and she tried hard to impress her new neighbors. She would throw lavish parties, though she was often not invited to others' parties, and she would go on spending sprees that surpassed that of most of her neighbors. On a whim, she would replace all the drapes in the house, hang all new art. She owned a $9,000 pipe organ, a jewelry chest containing eight trays of diamonds and pearls, inventoried at $98,000, a rope of pearls totaling $40 alone. I'm not even translating these into day money for you anymore. Custom-made hats and clothing from New York, sculptures imported from the Far East, furniture from Europe. Is it enough now, Cassie? Is that enough for you? Well, maybe you and me it would be, but our girl Cassie is girl bossing her way to the moon and beyond. She comes up with an idea to both explain away her mysterious background while continuing to rake in loads and loads of money independently from her husband. She is going to pose as the illegitimate daughter and heiress of Andrew Carnegie. At the time, Mr. Carnegie is living on Fifth Avenue in New York City, busy making his fortune in the steel industry. Now, the details of how and why she's in New York are kind of hazy, but we can be sure that she orchestrated it in a way that she would run into a colleague of her husband's there in New York City. His name is James Dillon. 
She asks if he'll be so kind as to accompany her to her father's house on a quick errand, and being the gentleman that he is, he obliges. When they roll up to Andrew Carnegie's house, however, Mr. Dillon is too shocked to speak. She asks him just please wait in the carriage for her. She won't be gone long. She walks right up the front steps, rings the bell, a butler opens the door, and she steps right inside, as if she's expected there. Inside, Cassie asks to speak to the housekeeper. The butler fetches her, and Cassie tells her she's considering hiring a new maid who has worked for the Carnegie family, and would they be able to furnish a reference for her? Cassie gives the name of this imaginary maid. The housekeeper has no idea who she's talking about. But is she sure? She said she worked there. Her name is Hilda Schmidt. She has brown hair, brown eyes. It's probably been six to eight months since she worked there. Nope, housekeeper doesn't know her. She supposes she can check with the staff. So Cassie waits there. The housekeeper goes to check, comes back. No, we don't know this, Hilda. Oh, well, must be some misunderstanding. So sorry. Profuse apologies. This front parlor is lovely, by the way. You must manage your stuff so well, blah, blah, blah. By the time she exits through the front door and returns to the waiting carriage with Mr. Dillon inside, it's been nearly half an hour. And she's now carrying a brown envelope with her that she didn't go in with. Mr. Dillon apologizes for being so forward, but he has to ask, who is her father? Of course, Cassie was counting on this, and she swears him to secrecy before she shows him the contents of the envelope, which contains two promissory notes totaling over $750,000 assigned by Andrew Carnegie himself and securities valued at a total of a cool $5 million. She reveals that she is Andrew Carnegie's illegitimate daughter and to compensate for the immense guilt he feels about this and also to buy her silence, he showers her with immense amounts of money. What's more, she already had $7 million in promissory notes tucked away at home and she is set to inherit over $400 million when Carnegie dies. Not a word of this is true. But who is going to ask Mr. Carnegie? No one. He is one of the most powerful men in the nation. So Mr. Dillon swears he'll keep her secret, but it's just so unbelievable he can't help but talk about it. And little by little, word starts to get around about the hush-hush fortune promised to Cassie Chadwick. Back in Cleveland, banks start to reach out to Cassie to offer their services. They offer her deposit boxes to store her documents in and allow her to borrow against her inheritance. She unflinchingly agrees to ultra-high interest rates, so now the banks aren't going to talk about these loans either. For the next eight years, she swindled numerous Northern Ohio banks, all by forging documents from Andrew Carnegie to prove her inheritance repaying the first loan with money from the second, repaying the second with money from the third, and so on. Somehow, I'm not sure how, probably by hypnosis, you know, she even got the president of Citizens National Bank to loan her money from his personal accounts. So did it work? Did it skyrocket her into the scene of the social elite? Reportedly, yes. Yes, it did. Because money talks. One year for Christmas, she bought pianos for all of her friends. And she bought herself a musical chair that played a little tune when someone sat down on it. She also claimed she donated to charities and the suffrage movement. In 1904, though, Cassie is connected with Herbert Newton, a banker in Massachusetts. He grants her a $190,000 loan, but somehow learns of all of her other open loans in Ohio, and he's like, I'm sorry, no, you do not need this. You can pay me back right now. So he calls in his loan. And she can't pay it, and she can't talk her way out of it, and the whole thing starts to unravel. She flees to New York, but she's quickly found and brought back to Ohio. Her husband quick files for divorce and takes off for Europe as the scandal breaks. And then there was a run on the Citizens National Bank that forced them into bankruptcy. The trial, as you can imagine, is a media circus. Even Andrew Carnegie himself turned out to see the woman who had so successfully conned so many financial institutions by invoking his name. He stated that he hadn't issued anyone a promissory note in over 20 years, and had anyone bothered to ask him, he could have saved everyone a lot of time and money. Cassie was charged with conspiracy to bankrupt Citizens National Bank and conspiracy against the government, as the banks she victimized were federally chartered. She denied all accusations and swore up and down she never said or led anyone to believe Andrew Carnegie was her father. In March 1905, however, at the age of 48, she is found guilty and sentenced to 14 years in a woman's facility at Ohio State Penitentiary and is fined $70,000. 
Due to her celebrity status, the warden allowed her to outfit her cell with many comforts of home, including clothes, photographs, and furniture. Despite this, her health was failing her, and she suffered a nervous collapse in September 1907, where she lost her eyesight. She was reported to be suffering heart and stomach problems, and in October 1907, just two years into her sentence, she died in prison. She was buried at what is now called the Woodstock Angelican Cemetery in Woodstock, Ontario, where her headstone reads, Elizabeth Bigley, wife of L.S. Chadwick, M.D. Dr. Chadwick, her husband, is actually buried in Florida, where his daughter from his first marriage is also buried, but it does not appear that he ever married again. There is apparently a movie about her scheduled to come out in 2023 called The Duchess of Criminality, so watch for that. At the end of stories like these, I never know if I should feel proud or not of the people who run these cons. It's a bit of a Robin Hood quandary, right? Like, the rich are so rich. So rich. And during a time when women couldn't even vote or open a bank account, no one even suspected a woman could pull off such a complex con because she's only a woman, right? That part makes my blood boil, but not all her victims were rich, and she did steal a lot of money and lie to a lot of people. And that is wrong. But what do you guys think? Do we applaud her or are we appalled? If you head over to Instagram or TikTok at a good night for a murder, you can let me know there. Plus, see some photos of Cassie, the home she lived in, her husband's, and of her arrest. You can also see the photos on my episode blog and all the source links on my website at a goodnightforamurder.com. You can also sign up for the Good Night for a Murder newsletter on the website. Each month, I send an episode roundup, reveal of next month's episodes, and other goodies like book recommendations, extra Victorian society tips, and more. The bonus content for Housekeeper and Butler to your patrons for this episode is one more story of a famous Victorian female con artist. To subscribe to Patreon and learn more about the podcast, you can visit a goodnightforamurder.com. Also, follow me on Instagram or TikTok at a goodnightforamurder. Please rate and review and share with friends. Thank you for listening, and I will talk to you again soon.